Hi, my name is Glenn Weinrib, and today we're going to look at the economics associated with climate change. But first, let's review basic concepts of electricity. On most home electric bills, electricity use is measured in units of kilowatt hours. For example, when a guy vacuums for his wife for an hour, he's consuming approximately one kilowatt hour of electricity. The typical U.S. home consumes 10,000 kilowatt hours each year at 14 pennies per kilowatt hour for a total of $1,400 per year. This is retail cost and it covers electricity generation and distribution. Generation refers to making electricity at the power plant, while distribution refers to the network of power wires between generation plants and consumers. Typically, seven cents per kilowatt hour goes to generation and seven cents to distribution. Green electricity, which is produced without emitting carbon dioxide, sometimes costs one penny more per kilowatt hour than electricity from fossil fuel. This is without subsidies and without taxes. Currently, roughly 40% of U.S. electricity is green, which means 60% still needs to be decarbonized. If we decarbonize 60% over 12 years, 5% would be decarbonized each year. According to the math, 5% of 10,000 at an additional one penny is $5 per year. Therefore, the additional cost per household would be $5 in the first year, 10 in the second year, and 15 in the third. So while costs grow gradually, they start out surprisingly low, just $5 per year in the beginning. Electricity from solar panels installed on a house typically costs about three times more than electricity from a solar farm. Why the difference? It comes down to overhead. At the household level, each installation involves marketing costs, mechanical and electrical design, city permits, installation, and final inspection. Alternatively, at a solar farm, these costs are not incurred every 15 solar panels. In other words, it costs much less to decarbonize by building solar farms than to place solar panels on unique structures. Perhaps a more interesting question is, why is this rarely discussed? The problem is, no one benefits from reducing their own carbon dioxide emissions. They're too small. Instead, one only benefits when the other 8 billion people on the planet reduce their emissions. For this reason, no one seems to care how much carbon dioxide they reduce per dollar spent. Furthermore, there's no mechanism that causes us to decarbonize at the lowest cost. And this puts us at risk of running out of money before achieving significant progress. Okay, let's move on from homes and look at companies. We often encourage companies to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions. But in practice, they face two choices. They can either decarbonize for real at high cost, or they can appear to decarbonize at less cost. For publicly traded companies, spending more on climate action usually means lower profit, which can push stock prices down. But CEOs are expected to do the opposite. They are expected to increase profit and increase stock price. So many respond with token climate efforts designed to look good while keeping costs low. One common approach is to buy carbon offsets. In theory, these pay for projects that reduce carbon dioxide emissions. But in many cases, they do not deliver as promised. For example, if an offset blocks tree farmers from harvesting on one parcel of land, and trees are instead harvested elsewhere, there's no benefit. Ultimately, CEOs need to select either more decarbonization and less profit or less decarbonization and 
more profit. Too often, they choose the latter option, in part because their decarbonization claims are rarely verified. So homes and companies are bad at tackling climate change. However, this is not a problem. This is because we only need power companies to take care of this, especially during the early years. More specifically, we only need a one-sentence law to decarbonize one-third of carbon dioxide emissions within a 30-year decarbonization. This is power companies are required to decarbonize electrical power over 10 years in lowest cost order and pass additional costs or savings onto consumers. Nations know about this sentence, yet they refrain from participation since they don't want additional costs to make them less competitive. This is consistent with economics, which states consumers mostly buy at the lowest cost. The only way to get around this is to do R&D to the extent required to drive down the cost of 24-7 green energy to below that of fossil fuel. For details, see climate videos 11 through 17. Additionally, we have a global warming problem, and to resolve that, we need to figure out how to reflect sunlight back into outer space at reasonable cost and without harm. For details, see climate videos 6 through 10. Okay, so what is the world currently doing about climate change? Let's examine this through the lens of economics. Some regions are more sunny, while others are more windy. As one might imagine, it costs less to generate electricity with a solar farm in a sunny region, and it costs less to generate electricity with a wind farm in a windy region. Yet, by how much? This table shows the wholesale cost of electricity from solar farms built in the year 2025 and projected costs for the year 2033. These costs are estimated by the U.S. government's National Renewable Energy Laboratory. The units shown here are megawatt hours, which are a thousand times larger than kilowatt hours. Wind energy tells a similar story. It's often windy at higher altitudes, so windmills are technically feasible in many areas. But because of audio noise and other concerns, they cannot be placed too close to people. That's why wind farms are typically set up in remote areas. For example, windmills for U.S. East Coast cities are likely to reside 200 miles inland. We currently have facilities that produce electrical power by burning natural gas or coal. These plants have already been built and paid for, and they are needed for times when the sun does not shine and the wind does not blow. Therefore, to go green, solar and wind electricity costs need to be less than the incremental costs incurred at the nearby fossil fuel-based power plant, which are shown here in red. In other words, the cost to decarbonize is a green electricity cost minus an incremental fossil fuel cost. In many cases, solar and wind decarbonization costs are favorable, yet not always. Okay, so how might green energy costs change over the next 30 years? The United States government provides an estimate as shown here. In summary, solar and wind are expected to be somewhat competitive with fossil fuel. However, the more reliable forms of green energy, such as those available 24-7, are projected to remain more expensive for many decades. The U.S. government green electricity cost projections can be downloaded for free, and one can use this data to predict what would happen if U.S. electrical power was decarbonized in lowest cost order. We did this, and one can get a free copy of our analysis by clicking on the link in the description below. We looked at reducing U.S. carbon dioxide emissions 1 30th per year over 30 years to get to zero emissions. 30 years from now. And we looked at doing this in lowest cost order, 
we found decarbonization costs would be close to zero for the first five years and then go up. In other words, decarbonization would be easy at first and then less easy. And a surge of R&D in key areas could make the later years easy too. The United Nations set up an organization called the IPCC that studies how to decarbonize. And a summary of their research is shown here. Each bar represents a different way to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, where the length of the bar represents the amount of reduction and the color indicates the cost. And they arrived at the same conclusion, which is that one-sixth of carbon dioxide emissions can be avoided at close to no additional cost. However, they don't explain how to tackle the remaining five-sixths in a way that is both politically and economically feasible. Okay, so why is decarbonization difficult? Well, let's examine several key points. When building up solar power, the amount of electricity from solar panels eventually exceeds the amount of electricity consumed by customers when sunny. If one builds further, electricity is discarded due to supply from solar exceeding demand. This is referred to as solar saturation, and at this point, solar construction stops. Ultimately, there is a limit to how much decarbonization can be achieved with solar power. The same applies to wind power. So what impact would global solar saturation have on global carbon dioxide emissions? Let's quantify. The sun burns bright about six hours out of every 24, which means we can get roughly 25% of our electrical power from solar. Also, roughly one third of carbon dioxide emissions are from electrical power. Therefore, building up solar until saturation would decrease global carbon dioxide emissions by approximately 8%. Also, the IPCC came up with the same conclusion. They estimate maximum decarbonization due to solar to be 4 gigatons out of 60, which is about 8%. In other words, don't expect solar to save us from climate change. Global GDP growth is approximately 3% per year, which works out to an 80% increase over 20 years. Therefore, if solar was built up to saturation over 20 years, global carbon dioxide emissions would increase 72% if only influenced by solar construction and GDP growth. It's worth noting global carbon dioxide emissions have increased over the last several decades, in part due to GDP growth. This graph shows a U.S. government projection of carbon dioxide emissions from the U.S. over the next 30 years. This includes all energy, not just electricity. And this projection is based on basic principles of economics, which assumes consumers mostly buy at lowest cost. In other words, they are not inclined to pay more for green products. As one can see, annual carbon dioxide emissions fell by about 1.2 billion tons over the last 20 years. But surprisingly, most of this decline had little to do with renewable energy or government policy. Instead, about 80% of the drop came from natural gas costing less than coal. Due to internal chemistry, Natural gas produces half as much carbon dioxide per unit energy. Therefore, switching over reduces carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, that was the past. What about the future? Well, U.S. economists expect more decarbonization over the next decade, driven mainly by three things. One, low-cost solar farms. Two, low-cost wind farms. And three, natural gas costs less than coal. Also, each of these has limits. Solar and wind can't be built beyond saturation, and there's only a limited number of coal plants left to replace. Once these limits are reached, decarbonization will slow, and 
in the U.S. government's projection, it basically stops. Okay, so now what? Well, additional R&D beyond what the U.S. government expects could potentially change this trajectory. Our society's fundamental approach to climate is to broadcast the following message. Climate is bad, go do something. This is sometimes referred to as virtue signaling, and at first glance, it might seem helpful. However, it leads to wasted time, wasted money, and confusion. This is because we push on people who do not have the ability to respond effectively. Instead, we need to calm down, start with a blank piece of paper, and put together a plan that fixes the entire climate problem while observing basic principles of economic science and engineering. One might think of this as an engineered approach to climate change. For details on how this might work, see videos four and five. Okay, that's it for me, and I'll talk to you all real soon.